Hey bosses, wanted to tell you about a way you can connect with other Travel Like a Boss podcast listeners, talk about travel, online business, and discuss previous episodes as well as suggest future guests. Join our Facebook group, Travel Bosses, by going to facebook.com and searching for Travel Like a Boss podcast, clicking like, and clicking join group. Join our digital nomad Travel Bosses group today. Welcome to the Travel Like a Boss podcast, where we interview location-independent entrepreneurs that travel the world like a boss by being their own boss. Here's your host, Johnny FD. Mike, what's up, buddy? Good to, ha- good to have you on. How's it going, dude? Yeah, it, it's been pretty hectic morning, right? I know, but you know what? We're here, so I'm excited. And guys, welcome to episode 250 of the Travel Like a Boss podcast. Uh, and for those who are watching on YouTube, what's up? Cool, cool, cool. Uh, so what, what's like, um, I'm just like curious because, you know, whenever we go on certain podcasts, uh, people have like different formats of it. So I'm, I'm like trying to see what, wh- where do I fit in this? Is it just going to be like bouncing back and forth or like interview style? It's always like a weird, awkward thing in the beginning of like every podcast, wherever like yeah. the host wants to. Well, the funny thing is like whenever I'm a guest of someone else's podcast, I end up almost kind of leading it like I do my yeah. own. So I, I, you know, that's why I always, it always ends up being like a travel like a boss podcast, even though it's, yeah. you know, they're like, you know, top money mistakes podcast or something. So I start talking about mm-hmm. travel and start kind of just telling stories, but yeah, we, we keep this pretty casual. Oh yeah. Cool. Yeah. That, that's what I do too. Um, I press record and the podcast starts even before like the podcast actually starts. Like I'll just, uh, shoot the shit. Am I allowed to swear on yours? Yeah, Probably. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I'll just like shoot the shit with someone and then it'll be like 10 minutes in and they're gonna be like, yo, when are we going to start the podcast? I'm like, dude, we started like 10 minutes ago. This is it. You're in it. And then at the end, I'll just, uh, recap everything that we talked about and then I'll just put that as the intro. So then, cause if you ever realize when you podcast with someone and they put on this like coaching mask, like, Oh, I need to be Mr. Expert right here. And, uh, really like be someone on this podcast. You ever feel like that? Yeah. And I think in the beginning it's because people are so used to short form content where they have to get their message out in the first, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes or 20 minutes. So I've noticed that with my podcast, usually around the 40 minute mark, people start really opening up and they start talking about things that they've never shared on another interview, another podcast before, because they get comfortable, number one, but also all the things that they wanted to say have been said. And that's why I really like you know, the Joe Rogan podcast, like three hours long. For me, I think about an hour is, is good because uh, you start getting that nuggets. And I sh- what I should do is do that recap so it gets people excited to listen to the whole thing. But mm-hmm. I actually do a lot of things poorly marketing wise because I want to reward the people who just sit and listen anyways. And I don't, I don't want to get like hook them in. You know, I don't want to feel like I need to hook them in. I just want people to listen to that, that episode knowing this is going to be good value. And honestly, it's, 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 it's something that, that I've been doing poorly, even though I know I should be doing the opposite. Dude, it's so weird though, because like, I, I don't know if you <clears throat> even know this, right? Cause you're like the Chiang Mai OG, like digital nomad OG. Uh, like I'll literally talk to so many people and they'll say the reason why they're traveling or they went to Chiang Mai or, uh, started doing something was because, uh, something of yours like hooked them. And then they started going down like the Johnny FD rabbit hole. And then they were like, Oh, Chiang Mai. And then, um, yeah, dude. So it's actually really crazy because there's like the, the impact that you've had on a lot of people that were just, you know, entrepreneurs say, for example, in the States, but were looking to travel has just been so like big. I don't know if you even realize that, but I feel like if you could just hook them in, in the, in the beginning, your impact would be so much bigger because you have so much years of content that's actually, and it, and it feels weird because it, it doesn't feel congruent in the beginning, but to get people that are on like the ADD, just framework of their mind, they need to just be caught in for a little bit. But then I feel like once they dig in your content, man, I remember when I got started um, in Chicago, right? I was, I was just gonna, I was gonna get an apartment in Chicago. I was making money online already. I was like, oh, this is cool. I was gonna go down and just start uh, a race to the bottom, basically, of me seeing all of my friends that were also succeeding online, had them getting penthouses, nice cars. And I was like, oh, I want this too, right? I remember looking at um, apartments in Chicago. I think I was like 21 or something. And I was like, oh, this is it. I don't have to be a dentist anymore. This is gonna be dope. 
And I kid you not, it was because of one thing that you did that was a little hook that at first I was like, who the hell is this guy? I think it was like one of your Anton uh, ads that a uh, dropship lifestyle was doing. I was like, who's this Asian dude with like glasses, right? And there was mm-hmm. no call to action. So it was a little weirded out. Um, <laughs> and I saw that. No, no, seriously. Like, I don't know. What, what was the and, video? And Do you remember? Think, yeah, I know exactly what it is. I was, because uh, I was in the e-commerce space a lot. And I would get ads for e-commerce and um, Dropship Lifestyle had this ad of you. So it wasn't necessarily your marketing that got me in. It was like, like he was, I guess, paying for the ads to just show that. And I guess building an audience from there. Um, but then I just was like, who the hell is this guy? It was like a video of you like doing a testimonial um, uh, to your, uh, to, to, I think, it was, it was to his offer, but they weren't selling anything. And like, hey, guys, there's no link on this. This is just like an authentic testimonial. You had like these glasses on. Um, and I was like, okay, who like the hell some is gla- Like sunglasses or then like? That, no, it was just like really uh, strong looking eyeglasses. It, it was oh, like okay. pretty interesting. I, I, I don't think you wear those anymore. And, and then I started like seeing, okay, who the hell is this guy? And I started going deep in the rabbit hole, right? So I feel like in terms of marketing things, you need that kind of one polarizing hook in the mm. in the beginning but once they went in dude like i remember like going through your your blog post i was like okay maybe i don't need to actually go to uh, chicago maybe i could try this thailand thing out and, and I, was, I didn't know anything about thailand right so i remember getting your book on amazon and it's so funny this is like all full circle right okay. i uh went through the book thinking that i was gonna get some type of you know travel guide because i didn't understand how to say coping yang or co i was like what the hell this is just all new to me but it was really interesting the moment it went from like uh travel traveling guides to i, I kid you not I was talking with Riley Bennett uh, from uh-huh. Living That Life. He was saying the same thing. Halfway through, it goes to, it turns into like 50 Shades of Johnny, you know? <laughs> and then the moment it went from traveling, oh yeah, you know, I was slinging chia seeds and uh, making a living. Just, you know, that was the funniest thing. Just slinging chia seeds, fighting, just like straight up gangster digital nomad style. It turned 50 Shades of Johnny and I was like, oh man, maybe I should check out this Thailand thing out, you know? So that's kind of, I feel like what you are to a lot of people, not only like the, the guy that kind of got more people to realize the four hour work week was real, but you were also kind of like the shades of gray version of a bottom up. Yeah. Oh man. You know, hold on. The, uh, the Wi-Fi was cutting out for a second, but I, I think I think people got the gist of that. The, I'm the Fifty Shades of Grey of Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Work Week. Is that what you said? That's exactly. It's a and it's a, was, it's a pretty big character development. That's process. crazy. Well, okay. So if anyone wants to read the book, it's called Twelve Weeks in Thailand: The Good Life on the Cheap. It's still on Amazon. And the funny thing is, I've actually thought about updating it and kind of rewriting it and getting rid of some of that really raunchy. Like, so I hooked up with a Swedish girl at the full moon party and like banged like on the beach, like in the sand. Because that was such a, a big part of my past, like 10 plus years ago, that's no longer, you know, me. But I decided just to just leave it because I'm like, you know what? I bet you there's a lot of guys who are young, like in their 20s, who that's, if that is what, you know, can get them on a plane to Thailand, then so be it, you know? Because it wasn't until I got there, you know, if it wasn't for, you know, like wanting to hook up with, with chicks, I never would have picked up a self-help book. I never would have went in the self-help section. I never would have, you know, read in to, you know, to buy like these books on like the game or like pickup lines. But if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have picked up for our work week or rich dad, poor dad and millionaire fast lane and got down that route. And if it wasn't mm-hmm. for that, I never would have moved to Thailand. I never would have done more Thai or scuba diving. And I know it sounds all so unrelated, but it was really, literally like that ladder that, that pulled me in. And I think that's why I share everything so openly because I don't know what is going to encourage someone to get off their ass and live and mm. live a happy life or fi- try to find fulfillment, try to find happiness. But for me, it was literally just like this weird path of like, you know, I'm going to go to Thailand for scuba diving, but then I'm end up falling in love with Muay Thai. And then, you know, along the way, I still feel the need, the urge of, you know, trying to hook up with as many girls as possible. And it was only after I did that for, you know, five years, I realized, you know what, I don't really need that anymore. Now I moved on to the next stage, but I think I needed to do that. And I'm, and, and that's why I'm happy that book is there. And I'm happy it draw, drew young guys like you into, you know, the life of travel and the, and the life of uh, entrepreneurship and self-help. Mm. Yeah, it's like so weird, right? When you have like uh, content about you, 
uh, based off of a previous version of you. Mm-hmm. And then you start seeing the type of people it attracts, but then it's almost like a mirror to someone that you used to be. So sometimes, mm-hmm. like, for example, for me, it'll even like trigger me, you know, where it, it's like just a reminder of who I used to be. Like, I remember uh, back in the day, I was just making a bunch of like make money online videos, right? Um, and And all of that content just existed on like multiple platforms. And I, I find social media and, you know, the content that we put out is like an extension of either our consciousness or our personality that just attracts more of those types of people in, right? And when I was doing a bunch of those videos and I had to like really, you know, I remember um, there was a park in Chiang Mai where I was like starting the YouTube, right? And and I was just like, okay, I'm going to just jump out of this bush with a red bandana and, and I'm just going to teach people how to make money online. It's going to be something that's unforeseen. Like I'm going to do the opposite of everybody else. Ty Lopez has, you know, uh, a Lamborghini and like all of these uh, big houses. I'm going to live in a shack and uh, not like cut my hair and just be as homeless looking as possible. And that was kind of think my USP, right? I remember just jumping out of this bush while like a bunch of old Thai men were just like running in the back because it was also like a, it was like also one of those uh, walking parks. And it was so funny because when we would do the jump cuts, you would just see like a Thai man and then they would just like disappear <laughs> or like a random Thai woman. And then they would just like disappear. And and I was like making these videos on um, kind of like just uh, making that ripple effect from what happened to you. Just keep on going to see who I could attract. And it was so weird uh, when I started, you know, leaving Thailand and, and changing, you know, the mindset that I was kind of like wearing at the time, because I feel like every single time I travel to a new place or move to a different country, it kind of just resets your mind to just then recreate yourself for another way. I started realizing how much I've grown since then. Mm. But then, you know, you would show up to a place and um, say like you're going to an event or you're speaking at a conference or something. And I would see people that would come in from that content. And it was the weirdest thing, no longer resonating with who they were, but it's not their fault because they brought, they were brought in from a piece of content that I created like a year or two ago when, you know, I mean, this is your podcast, Travel Like a Boss. When you travel, dude, it's like you grow Mm -hmm. and there's like different versions of you like every six to 12 months, Mm -hmm. like every six to 12 months that you, who everyone knew you as just died. And then there was just a new version of Johnny, you know, and a bike. And, And I think a lot of people don't realize this, but with travel entrepreneurship, you know, especially the type, the, the way we do it, it's, it's full time and it's 100% immersed. It accelerates life. Like I really believe that I've had more experiences and I've been through more, you know, good things as well as bad things, but as well as, you know, expanded my mind, met people from different countries more than a typical person, even in California or back in the US would in like five lifetimes. And I know this because every time I go visit my friends back home and, you know, this isn't some small redneck town that doesn't, you know, have a big population. You know, this is like California, like Southern California, LA, San Diego, San Francisco. You would think that they beat, you know, tons of people who get really open minded. I go there and I'm like, man, every couple of years, I feel like I've, I've done so much. And I've experienced so much, yet my friends, you know, my old college friends or high school friends back home, their lives are pretty stagnant. Mm. And I think this is like a very unique trait of nomads. And, and sometimes I'll even listen to like guys like Tim Ferriss or Joe Rogan, who, you know, multi-millionaires, well-connected, you know, they, they dedicate their lives to learning knowledge and finding out about things. And I'll be shocked when they'll talk about something that I've come across years ago or I've experimented with already and that they're just finding now. And I'll be like, how is that even possible? And it's only because they're in in general, in their bubble in LA or San Francisco or Austin. And yeah, they travel, but not like the way we do. And we meet people from, you know, Berlin or Australia or South Africa, all these random places. And we spend so much time with them. We have so little responsibilities, but we're not managing all this other stuff that all we have time to do is learn. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, dude, it's weird. But I think also on the other end of things, it, uh, it puts a toll on you, right? Like you just, like I, I'm 26 now and I just feel like an old ass man. Like I'll have yeah. conversations uh, with, you know, like people in their states, right? Like, so for example, it, it's just really weird. So one of the things that we're doing uh, with a bunch of like JV partners and stuff like that is I'm like kind of the marketing end of um, their products, right? So like I realized, for example, for me, you know, I've done like every single business model known to man and I've succeeded in it a lot, failed in most. Um, 
But with at the end of the day, you know, just like, what, what's that thing? Yo, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the only downside about this laptop is this laptop, for some reason, the Wi-Fi sucks, but the other laptop, it doesn't suck. And I think it's just Bali. It's just weird. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, you're in Bali. I'm in Sri Lanka. Both have like prehistoric internet. I mean, it's usable, but it's like for video chat. Sorry, apologize to everyone watching on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you guys are watching this and you guys see, just hear our voices go, <laughs> it's just because our Wi Fi is like so bad. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, one of the things was, you know, working with these other partners, I, I, I tried doing a bunch of stuff on my own and I realized the more I put on my own plate, the more overwhelming it is. So, uh, one of the things that we've been doing is I'm just partnering with people that have existing products and then just like, like if, if it resonates with my audience, um, building all the marketing infrastructures behind it. Right. Uh, so we're, we're that got super robot wonk right now you know let me see if i can switch to my my 4g hold on my bad i'm I'm gonna switch my 4g maybe at least one of us can uh have good internet give me two seconds let me switch to a different this is this better yeah yeah is mine better yeah dude i think it was my fault is it okay it's all right it's probably both of us that's it's good we we can (laughs) just keep going i think i don't think people will mind all right cool yeah, so I'll, I'll sell these products that are other people's, but at the end of the day, it's like, you know, you want to know who's on the other end of um, the people that are actually buying, right? So you could optimize the marketing machine. Mm-hmm. So I would actually get on a phone call with um, some people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. And it's actually really weird. My audience went from 18 to 24-year-old males to 25 and 44-year-old women. Um, so that was just like a complete blind side on what, what I needed to do in terms of the marketing end, right? I couldn't necessarily run around and uh, just jump out of bushes anymore with time and walking in the background, just teleporting with every jump cut. Um, but, but like, I'd be just amazed in how, you know, there's literally people that are getting older and older and older, but they still haven't like, and it's not their fault. Right. But, but the way that society just keeps you in this bubble, it, it's just like, you, you know, that there's so much potential in a lot of them. And it, it's because their environment isn't conducive to their growth that they're still stuck and feeling lost and overwhelmed. And I think one of the biggest things, right, is there was this quote that I, I heard and it said, if the flower doesn't grow, you don't change the flower. You just change the environment in which it grows in. I feel like there's so much amazing human beings, for example, back in the States or in UK or in Australia that have so much freaking potential that probably have an idea that could change the world. But because their environment is like like putting a, a seed in, in just garbage, it'll never act sprout right and and i think that was the biggest thing what travel did is not only are you able to like replant yourself from that negativity but you're able to just continue to replant yourself and then taking those seeds and then planting it in more places and you're just like cross-pollinating and then before you know it your ideas and your experiences when you have conversations with other people that have also gone through the same thing and gone through so many experiences and lifetimes and lessons it's almost like everyone has like brain babies with mm-hmm. each other as everyone's just having like idea sex. And then you have like this, this, this phenomenal idea that couldn't possibly have been made from, you know, such a negative environment. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you know, a lot of times it is that negative environment, but sometimes it's also just like too much competition, right? Like if you're, yeah. you know, trying to sprout your, your, you know, your, your, um, your plant, your seedling, and you're in a concrete jungle with a million other plants, like, pushed together and there's so much competition for light and scarcity yeah. it's hard but if you're out you know somewhere where like you have room to grow and you know you can move it just makes it so much easier you know and mm. i think just experiencing you know different soils different air different water it like it really helps us grow and i but the thing is honestly man i i feel like sometimes there's there's downsides to that too where it's hard to just be content and just be one place and say like oh this is a nice plot of land let me just chill here <laughs> let me just be happy st- putting down roots and staying here i feel like even though we want to do that we find ourselves always thinking okay like what's the next journey what's the next step mm. it's, it's kind of like an add here right it, it just becomes the new drug what would you say what would you say right now um with everything that you're doing right now what would you say your main top five values are yeah so it's changed a lot and actually what's funny is so and how did we, that change from the book yeah 
So I wrote 12 Weeks in Thailand back in like 2012, 2013. And that, you know, that was so what, seven years ago. So I was like, I was much younger. I was like barely 30 at the time. And I had just gone through and, and the thing, and remember that book, you know, it wasn't like what I did that, that month. It was a recap on what I did the last five years. So, you know, if anyone hasn't followed my journey, like my whole life has been an experiment of trying to find, you know, what happiness might be, right? And mm. in the US, I was chasing all the wrong things, you know? I, I thought if I can learn how to pick up girls, that would make me happy. And it didn't, you know? I mean, I'm, I'm glad I went through all these experiences because that taught, taught me some self-confidence, how to talk to people, but really more importantly, that you could change. And that if you, if you bark down the wrong tree, you know, you might pick up habits, you know, or do things, you know, like say things things and, you know, you know, embarrassing things that just follow you around forever. But I also learned a lot of, of positive things from that, you know, like uh, better posture, body language. It, it got me to start working out again. It got me to start, you know, saying like, hey, you know, maybe I should actually become an interesting person. So I have interesting things to say. And that led me through for our work week. And for the, you know, those, you know, five years, I was still kind of like this young guy in Thailand for the first time with freedom for the first time. And that's, you know, in my like kind of early and mid twenties, that's when I was like partying, you know, doing Muay Thai, like literally fighting professionally with no health insurance, you know, and, oh you know, God. you know, and trying to hook up with, you know, with like European chicks and at a full moon party. And it was fun. And that's, that's when 12 weeks in Thailand was, <laughs> was, was written you know, and yeah, so my values have changed a lot kind of throughout the years, well, you know, and what I wanted in life, what I thought would make me happy. But when I met you, actually, when you interviewed me for your channel at Pun Space, I think, what year was that? Do you remember? That must be like 2015, uh, 2016. 2015, maybe. Yeah, so you, ha you were just getting started with your kind of your journey. You're young and excited. You like just like, I mean, that's the red bandana days when you're jumping out of bushes. Yeah, yeah I was. But, I don't know if you know this, but that was like the end of my, a, another chapter in my life where I was like very unsure what I wanted to do next. Because even though I was making good money with drop shipping, with affiliate marketing, I just wasn't really that excited anymore about online business. You know, I, I, I think for those four years, I was like 80 hours a week, either working or talking about work. And it was exciting to me. It was, it was really my passion. I really enjoyed doing it. But then at that point, I was like, you know what? I don't like, this isn't what I want to do anymore. It's, it's not making me happy anymore. And I was kind of in this, re I was, I was rewatching that video and I was kind of cringing because I was like, man, I can tell by my posture. I was kind of out of, I was super out of shape. I was like, you know what? I think I'm, you know, like Mike's this super energetic, excited young guy. So I want to try to give his audience some excitement. But deep down inside, I was like, man, I just want to chill. Like I want, I don't even want to talk about business. I want to talk about like playing chess or something. Dude, are you good at chess? I'm okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not bad. Dude, I, I was um I was playing chess. I was actually in the chess team in high school. Mm -hmm. Um, I got so I think I have a super addictive personality mm -hmm. because I was playing like fifty games at a time on the chess.com app, and like oh, I man. started getting really good at it. Like in high school, now now not as good. Okay. I think I was like ranked seventh seventieth in the state of Illinois. Wow. Okay, so I'm not that good, but <laughs> I like I enjoy playing. We'll, we'll, we can play a game one day. <laughs> nice, dude. That's so interesting, dude, because. I was thinking, you know, when I go to events and I see the people that are like a mirror of my older self, I didn't even realize that that's exactly what happened to you, you know? Like here you are now on the second stage of your life, which is you've done the fun. Now it's like chasing purpose and fulfillment. And and then here was this guy that's just like 50 shades of Johnny, here I come, you know? And uh, man, that, that's so interesting because I, I remember that day. I was like excited. I was like, oh my God, Johnny, 50 shades of Johnny. I'm going to interview him. This is going to be crazy. And I think there's also pressure when you're talking to a camera and then you have someone to your side doing the interview yeah. uh, because then you feel like you have to expand your personality and talking instead of having a conversation like this person is like uh, the center of attention as opposed to I feel like where people really get the value is when that camera isn't the center of attention and we're just having this authentic conversation and they're just like eavesdropping on some mm -hmm. really good nuggets. Yeah. Right? I think that was also one of the biggest plays because I started getting really burnt out just talking to the camera. Um, I started yeah. realizing I was just doing it to chase 
uh, revenue and to like my happiness then was tied to the amount of views and, and stuff like that. But then I realized it was like, okay, I, I, uh, I was around this time. One of the things that changed my life, uh, I started being surrounded by a lot of people that were like, for example, in the crypto investing area, right? Cause if you go to Chiang Mai, there was a good year where you're either a drop shipper, Amazon FBA person, or you did crypto. There was, that, that was like really the only three people there. And there was this one guy who would write articles for investors. Um, and he was like, he, he was always into all of the deal flow. You know, he got really good uh, just first dibs on certain projects that would start. And he, he told me something that completely changed my life forever. He said, Mike, you make videos and some videos you make get millions of views, right? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, I write an article on Medium and 12 people read it. I can see the stats. You know, only 12 people actually read my article. And then what he said was just completely earth shattering. He's like, but here's the thing, Mike, the 12 people that read my article, their net worth is like 10 times more than the millions of views that you're getting. And that was like the big shift that I, the big slap in the face that I needed. And I was like, okay, it's not necessarily about views. That's not actually the right optimization to optimize life in because who are those people behind those views, right? Are they, are they people that I actually want to be friends with? Can I do business deals with? Is there, is there something that they're not just a view in my book, but there's something that could turn into like a more meaningful relationship. And it was at that moment that I started having like an identity crisis. I feel like that you probably went through that so many people that just left their partying and, you know, full moon thing, like go through. And that was, who do I actually want to attract in my life? And how can I do things that if I'm going to knock one big domino down that are just going to knock down all of like the little dominoes. So that's, I think one of the things that I realized in that man that you met or that little kid that you met in Chiang Mai, that person had to die like 30 times for me to actually start realizing what was going to be, I guess, my new path. It was just weird because it was like, like half of you is with entrepreneurs, but the other half is also bouncing back between hostels and trying to like fit in and saying, oh, you know, I'm from, I just came in from Vietnam backpacking, even though you've been living in the country for like three or four months, you just want to you know, hang out with some regular hostel people for a bit. I don't know. It's weird, dude. It's just this entire paradigm of, of you just, I think, trying to find your authentic self and how can you just continually shed the layers of, of your mask? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And you know, some people from the outside, they might look and think our lives are great or perfect and they just don't understand that like, why is this person unhappy? Why is this person even want to to, to change or grow or, you know, become that next, that next step. And it's, it's almost like, you know, someone saying like, you know, why can't you just be happy being a caterpillar, <laughs> right? Like you got a good life. You're just eating, you know, munching around eating trees. And he's just like, no, man, like, you know, I feel like there's something else. I, I don't know what it is. And that's the problem. I think if we knew what the next step was and we can explain it and articulate it, it'd be fine. But usually when we go through that transition, we're not even really sure what else is possible or what else is new. We're kind of just like, you know what? I think I've, I feel like I've, I've learned as much as I can from this experience. Let me move on to the next thing, even though I don't know what that is yet. And it's going to be an awkward transition, you know, being in that cocoon for how many, however many months and kind of being like halfway in, halfway out for a while. But ultimately, for me, at least it's always been worth it. It's always been worth taking that chance of saying, you know what, let me, let me try to expand. So where did you go from there, from that conversation? Because uh, then that's also really curious. Like, that's what I'm really curious about. Because right now it's like, 2020, right? So that was a good amount, like four years ago. So in dog years, that's basically like a long ass time, right? Uh, so I think that's one of the things that I was also curious about that because I mean, you were in a, you were in a liminal space. You weren't where you wanted to be, but you're also, you're, you're also going like, uh, what, what is it? Liminal space is you're not who you used to be, but you're not who you want to be. So you're like in this transition phase, like in your cocoon. Um, where did you go from that conversation? Because- what, what people don't realize is those four years prior to me, um, seeing you like 2013 to 2016, those were like the best years of my life. And Mm. I was in such good shape. I was like the leanest I've ever been. I felt I had so much energy. I woke up every day, just like joy for the world. I I would listen, literally jump up naked, put on hip hop and just start dancing around. I had that much energy and I would go to sleep every day, just like feeling great. You know, I was making like 20 to $30,000 a month in profit. I had this amazing girlfriend that it was the first time I've ever been in love. And it was the first time I was ever like, you know what? 
I don't need to try to meet, you know, chicks all the time. Like I'm like, if this is what love is, I want to, I want to find, you know, I want to either be with her forever or I want to always find love. I want to have like real relationships. So everything was amazing. But when I had uh, met you, it was going downhill again. It was, that all ended. I, me and her had a really hard breakup, like the worst breakup imaginable. It took me years to get over. Like we were very, like it was, it was at a point where I went to South Africa, go meet her family. You know, we thought about getting married. You know, I was like, really like it was deep. And after we had broken up, well, actually on the day we had broken up doing CrossFit, I had tore my calf muscle and I was in a cast. So my fitness started going downhill. We had this hard breakup. I started drinking again. And for three years, I didn't touch any alcohol, but I was kind of just like depressed. And I was like, you know what? I got this money. I have all this money. I'm single. I don't know what else to do. Let me, let me just, you know, I can't work out. Let me just, you know, have fun. Or I started start going out. And, you know, it wasn't like I was alcoholic, but I was just not caring about my health anymore. You know, I started eating carbs again for three, like, I think two, three years. I didn't t- ha- touch a carb. I was eating like super strict paleo, doing CrossFit like six days a week. And then that was the only reason why I was in such good shape. But then I started eating like pizza again and bread again and pasta, you know, having beers with friends. I was still making really good money, but it was kind of that weird transition, you know, and I was just kind of unhappy. I pretty soon after I had met you and did that interview with you, I kind of started my next chapter in my life. So for the last three or four years, I kind of just winded down the business stuff. And I was like, you know what? I made enough money. I saved, luckily I saved 90% of it. I didn't spend it. And I think that was the, the big takeaway because I also knew a lot of guys making 20K a month or you know, more, but they just blew it all. You know, they had the penthouse in Bangkok. They were just like buying dumb crap, you know? Like literally some of them would buy like Xboxes and um, 16 inch TVs and leave it in a hotel room. Like they would use it for four days and just leave it because they were making so much money that it didn't matter. And luckily I'd saved and invested all of it. So for the last couple of years, I've really just been focused on that. You know, I started the Invest Like a Boss podcast. Um, I actually, you know, for, for those who listen to this podcast, like you'll notice that I've done less and less interviews. You know, sometimes like I'll have one an entire month. It's just, it just wasn't like my passion anymore. I, you know, and, but the Invest Like a Boss podcast, you know, has really taken over my life. Uh, I started living off of, you know, pretty much completely off of investments and just trying to like figure out like what makes me happy, you know, and for a while that was, you know, going to places that most nomads don't explore. So I started going to Eastern Europe, you know, to Ukraine, you know, to like, you know, these random countries around, around that block to, to Georgia and then to Sri Lanka and I picked up surfing. So really it's, it, I, I, it's almost like it took a few years of transition, but I finally, now I'm kind of like that new butterfly again or the new, I don't know, new caterpillar. I think that's one of the things I think that create the biggest change though, right? Um, I forgot who I was talking to, but before we have to kind of grow to the next level of our life, we have to kind of get our asses whooped uh, to a deeper level. Like kind of like when you're at the gym, uh, before you could actually do the one rep PR, you have to really destroy your body and actually get weaker for a bit, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And it's crazy because what you said with your relationship of um, like losing the love of your life, going through that entire thing, um, that was literally the exact same thing that happened when I was like 18 all the way up until 21, right? I, I created my identity and my sense of happiness on the feeling that I would get when I would be with my significant other. Um, and then the moment my girlfriend and I uncoupled, it was just like my entire life just went downhill. Right. And it was just for that moment that, cause, cause like we, we uncoupled because of money issues and finances. And, you know, I was like trying to start my online business and, you know, I had to focus all in on the online business, but she, she, like, I didn't have the time to spend with her. And when that happened, it, it turned into like this downward spiral in my life. And it was actually that downward spiral when I got so low that I started realizing that maybe my happiness shouldn't be based off of my identity with her. But what if I could just actually feel pure self-worth just because I am who I am. Mm -hmm. And then once I bounced back from that, the business success was just pure me running away from the pain point of that heartbreak. And I just felt like the more fast I could just run towards this business goal um, was the moment I could get out of it. So I feel like even though in those moments we, we completely hate it, like it sucks. And we're like, why is this happening to me again? I thought I dealt with this stuff. Like it's now 
turned into a trigger for me where when something bad happens, I'm all, like, at first I'm just like, oh, this is going to freaking suck. But then I'm like, okay, where is this going to now catapult me in the next three to five years that if this didn't happen, I would have just been pure, just on like a, just a straight line. You know, even though like there's ups and downs, if like, I think we look at our five-year um, horizon at like a five-year viewpoint, those ups and downs are, are kind of like going upwards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like the stock market, right? Like you can, you know, you can either invest in bonds and it pays, you know, maybe, you know, three, four percent and it's a pretty steady line. But if, if you factor kind of inflation, you're not really like growing that much versus the stock market goes up and down, up and down. But at the end of the day, you know, after 10 years or whatever, it's usually it's doubled. Mm. So what, what are you working on right now then after all that, that is causing you kind of like the happiness in all categories. You're able to, you know, continue being who you are. You don't have to put on a mask. Mm-hmm. Um, you're uh, making money, but you're also feeling like uh, this is more in alignment with what you're doing and it excites you. What would that be that thing for you right now? Lots of ayahuasca, lots of uh, psychedelic. No, <laughs> no uh, actually I, ha- I haven't touched that stuff. Like, I don't know, maybe 10 years, but uh, I-, I was actually tempted to, I was like, you know what? I, I'm in a, I was in a rut and I was like, you know what? I bet you if I, if I went into some mushroom, like a hard mushroom trip or some kind of like mind expanding uh, trip like DMT or Alaska, I bet you I'll get some clarity. But at the same time, I also, you know, I was like, you know what? I don't really need to do that. I can just do another 10 day Vipassana, you know, the silent meditation. Like that'll give me the same clarity. And then I was like, man, you know, I don't, really don't want to spend 10 days meditating again. And I was like, I, I was like, what, like, what is the next drug, you know, that I can take? But maybe I can also like, you know, learn from. So I, I took uh, Tony Robbins' uh, Date with Destiny. Oh, when, when did you he, take that? That was about two years ago. And it was, I mean, it was tough because I had to fly from Thailand to Florida and pay like five grand, you know, to, to take that event. And it, was, and it was like a six day event. It was hardcore. It was like 12 hours a day. And it was fun, you know, and, and that honestly it gave me the same kind of clarity as I would have if I did, you know, if I traveled to Peru to do ayahuasca, if I did a, another 10 day meditation here, I, th- I think it's, they're all similar. It's, it's kind of weird, man. But like now that I've kind of done all three, uh, you know, the hallucinogens, the meditation and the date with destiny, I think sometimes we just need to give ourselves six days to really focus on like on what we want and, and allow ourselves, whether it's from a internal, you know, source or an external source to, to help clarify like what we want. And and through that, I realized I was kind of in this weird limbo of wanting to settle down and have a home base and have certainty in my life, whether it's certainty of knowing I have my stuff, I have my, my home, I don't have to you know, worry about you know, you know, like things. Or if I wanted the uncertainty aspect, the excitement of seeing new things, going to new places. And I think a lot of nomads, especially ones that travel longer and longer, end up kind of settling down, you know, having that home base or even buying an apartment somewhere because they want that certainty. And I finally figured out that I don't need to have a place to, to, ha- to feel the same certainty. I can have that within myself and wherever I go. I just need to make that a priority. So to answer your question from you know 30 minutes ago, my top priorities now, one is I want to make sure I have enough money so I don't have to stress about myself. And, and you know, I don't need to have enough money where I can, get a, I can get a yacht or even fly business class all the time. I want to have enough money where I never have to stress about like needing to work again if I, if I don't want to. I also want to have enough money where I can take care of my, not only myself, but my parents and also be generous with my friends. So for the last maybe three or four years now, maybe, man, 2016, like four years now, I've been sending my mom a thousand bucks a month, every month, like clock, clockwork, it's on auto send. And I've been paying their property tax every year and kind of just taking care of their major, major bills. Cause you know, they didn't have the luxury of, you know, saving up for retirement, you know? So luckily they have like, you know, the social security coming in, it's, it's not that much money, but really like by me taking care of their big expenses and also just sending them some cash every month has allowed them to fully retire and not worry about money. And to me, that's a responsibility that I have now that I can't stop doing. You know, I can't just stop as much as sometimes I, I think like, oh, you know what? Maybe I just want to stop working completely. The amount of money I've, I've invested and saved up is enough where I can live for the rest of my life, but I can't also take care of my parents. And that's why I continue to work and try to grow my net worth. So, you know, financially, those are my two top priorities. And then kind of life-wise, I've decided I want to be 
in shape for the rest of my life because I want to feel good. I want to look good. I want to have that energy, but I don't want to go extreme anymore. So never again while I do, you know, a, an extreme diet, you know, I, like a lot of people don't know this, but I was strict vegan for like six months. I didn't even know really? the term. I, I thought I was just strict vegetarian, but also didn't, you know, I mean, I wasn't like, I wore like leather shoes still. So I didn't, you know, I probably wasn't vegan, but you have crystals. Yeah. Like, you I mean, I like, I like, I dove deep into that stuff. You know, I was, I was a member of PETA. I was wearing like PETA t-shirts and stickers and all that stuff. But yeah, I did that. I was super strict. Then I was strict paleo for, you know, two years, you know, I was super strict. Like, you know, like it would all be extreme, right? Where like, you know, if I started doing CrossFit, I would do CrossFit six days a week. If I did Muay Thai, I would, you know, I'd move into the Muay Thai camp and just do that forever. I realized those things work if you're extreme and you stick to it, but it's not a sustainable lifestyle. That's not something that you'd want to do forever. You know, it's, it, it's possible, but it's not something I want to do because it's so limiting, you know? So I've decided like now I want to just move and exercise a little bit every day and do, you know, and have an active lifestyle, whether it's walking, hiking, surfing, you know, doing, you know, not even doing jujitsu because that's, it's almost like something you know, you think you can do it for the rest of your life, but you really can't. Like as your body gets older, like you just get beat up, you get injured. So I've decided that like everything I do now needs to be something I can do for the rest of my life, you know, long-term happiness. And I still want to travel. I still want to see places, but I want to do it on my terms now. So I want to spend two, three, even six months in each location before I move. So I can just not be on a plane as much. You know, it's good for the environment. It's good for my health. It's good for my bank account. And I want to, you know, not have any responsibilities. And I think that was a big part of it. And it sounds ridiculous, but I I don't want to own anything. I don't want to own a house. I don't even want to own like too much stuff. So I've been traveling carry on only for the last year and a half, two years now. And ironically, by having less stuff, it's actually giving me more certainty in life where I know I can just move and not have to stress about like changing, a, you know, Airbnbs every couple of months, you know, I can, even if I lose everything, knock on wood, you know, it gets stolen. Like it's not that big of a deal. I just don't care like for things as much anymore. And now, and with dating, you know, back in my early twenties, you know, I thought I just need to hook up with as many hot, you know, chicks as possible and try to get that validation from them, you know, because that's what I needed. If I, if I didn't have a hot girlfriend, I didn't, you know, I, you know, if I didn't hook up, I was a loser, you know, and I was told this by society, by friends, by the media, but even just like, you know, maybe it was just something like also, you know, a false, uh, a false hope, you know, our idol that I was following. And now I realize, you know what, I want to have relationships, but they don't necessarily even need to be like super long term marriage. Like, I just want to always be like, have someone in my life, whether it's just to travel with and, you know, but we like from day one, we can just be open and honest with each other. And, and you know, and just say, you know what, let's, let's, let's enjoy the time we have together. And then if it leads to something else, that's good. But if it doesn't, it's fine. And I've been able to, you know, I think by like putting myself out there and saying, you know what, like, this is like who I am. And I think as we get older and as, as we kind of figure out what we want, like we limit ourselves to, to a lot of things where there's things that we just don't accept or don't want in our life. And we also even kind of repel like certain, you know, like certain people instead of trying to please everybody. But at the same time, by limiting ourselves, you know, we actually end up attracting the ones that really do fit. You know, it's almost like having more filters on your Airbnb search. <laughs> you would think that you'd be limiting yourself, but actually you're, you're, you're targeting the, 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 you know, you're attracting the right things in your life. Mm. Yeah, it's like so weird because um, like in business wise, that's that's what I think is the hardest thing, right? Because you're optimizing for profit, but you're also optimizing for like like sticking true to your values. And sometimes the values are too high, but the profits are too low. But then sometimes the profits are higher, but then it, you're, it, it's like going against your values. So like, how would you even find the middle point with that? Because relationships, you know, like I feel like relationships and um, business and all aspects of life, it's very like... Uh, synergistic, right? Like how you act in your relationships is also kind of the uh, type of qualities and habits you're going to also put in your business. So like, I think one of my biggest pain points is just being holistic in everything that I do instead of like what you said, doing um, like six days Muay Thai or like, like you, I'd be extreme vegan or I'd only eat steak for like every single meal. Right. And it's just like, how can you holistically, like, I, I feel like I've, I've solved that now in all aspects of my life, but now in terms of business, it's just like, how can then we build this business while sticking in line with uh, values 
while also making sure that everyone is taken care of, while also making sure that your your service or product that you're doing is doing a really good thing in the world. Um, I think for me, that's just been the hardest part without just, you know, pulling my hair out of my head and just going back and being like a solo entrepreneur, right? Like when when is it that you build a big business that, you know, there's a bunch of partners, you know, you have a team and when do you want to just go back to your travel blog? Like, screw it, screw all this. I'm just going to rank for how to make money blogging and make all my money from Bluehost. Like where's like the, the, the fine line in between, you know? Yeah. It, 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 that's a, I mean, that literally is a, a multi-million dollar question, right? And for, for me, a big part of it was I know I've sacrificed a lot of money on the table by deciding that, you know, what I, what I don't want to do anymore. You know, my income for, for a long time, and it's actually, it's ironically, it's gone back up now, but for a, for a few years, it dropped. Like it was, you know, at like four grand a month, you know, from 20, you know, 25,000 a month in profit to like three, you know, no, no, I don't think it was ever at three, but like let's say at $4,000 a month. And it was like, that's a big sh- lifestyle shift, right? And luckily, I'm and so grateful. Too, right? Identity, yeah. I, 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 I like, yeah, I would go to, screwed with your identity. oh my God, man. And I remember, I mean, because I host uh, these meetups, these dinner meetups called Six Figure Sushi. And the the way to get in is you have to make six figure hundred thousand a year. And I was like, I'm not making that right now. I was like, I, I was like, I felt I felt like a like a loser for you know inviting these ballers out. I still wanted to connect them. It wasn't even about me anymore. It was like I wanted them to meet each other, and connect with each other, especially in Chiang Mai, where a lot of people are are new and starting out. But there are people crushing it. They just don't meet each other because they don't go out. They don't go to the meetups. So I would host these dinners, and there'd be guys who were you know bringing in fifty k a month and profit and some guys who had just sold their business for you know a couple hundred thousand or sometimes even a couple million dollars and they would meet each other and they would love it you know they would really get a lot of value out of it and i'm glad i was able to bring them together but i would be sitting there thinking like man you know i made four grand last month like why like why am i even here you know and nobody ever said anything because you know they know that i used to make a lot of money and that my you know i had you know had the knowledge and the connections but it was you know i felt i felt out of place you know and luckily it's back up again but it, it was a really Really weird couple of years. Mm. How did you deal with that when when things started going down? Because because also I bet you another part of you almost wanted to just be like screw it, let's let's go back and start either slinging some courses or let's go back and you know start another store. Or there, there's always like this uh, urge to just go back to what used to bring the money. And then while while you're running towards that, it's also running away from this next version of your growth. You know. Like how did yeah. you not how did you not go back to I think um fifty cents in fiftieth law? He's like, you know, sometimes you just gotta go back and start selling cocaine, I think is what he said in one of the chapters. How did you not go back and start slinging chia seeds, you know? Yeah. Um a big part of it was not wanting the responsibilities. You know, I knew that I needed a break in life and I just I didn't have that that I, I, I knew if I continued to burn my candle at both ends that it wouldn't end well, you know, I would get burnt out. Mm. I knew that if I if I wanted to make more money, I could have just started another dropshipping store. So I would have the income from that, but also then I could start blogging about it again. I could start showing people how to do it. I could start getting affiliate commissions from Shopify, from Anton's course, from all the tools that I use, the email marketing tools I use, the phone support tools I can use. I could bring my income back up, and then I could sell the store and have like another big chunk of money, and that would actually bring me over the million mark in net worth. And then I can say, all right, I did that. Now I retire. But the reason why I never did it is, and it sounds silly, but I didn't want the responsibilities. I didn't want to have to wake up every morning with stress thinking, did I get a sale today? Did everything ship correctly? Or am I going to have an angry customer who gave me Mm. their old address and now there's a pe- fucking package sitting, you know, in another city and it has nothing to do with, you know, it's not my fault, but now it, it's my responsibility. Mm. And I was like, I, can't, I don't want to put myself through that again. I just like, I did it for, you know, five years and I'm so grateful every day that I saved all the money and I didn't need to do it again. But it was, it was a challenge to like, not to not do it. So I, I tried, I, I thought about, you know, maybe I can do a partnership where I can, you know, spend two months with these guys, build stores and be a part owner and they can run it day to day. So I've done that now twice, two years in a row. And some of the stores did pretty good. You know, like one of them is making, like it's crushing. It actually is doing better than my, the stores I built ever did. Like we, we did close to 50K in sales this month, which is over 10 grand in profit. And so it's a you know, six figure store. And if we sell that, it's going to be a big chunk. But 
you know, juggling seven people, you know, a lot of the stores like just never even launched, you know, because people got busy, you know, literally one of them, they decided they wanted to start a, yeah. a vegan YouTube channel instead of finishing the store, you know, like it just like, it was like so much work. And I was like, I was like, you know, that's not the answer either. You know, I was like, if the amount of time and effort I ended up putting in, I could have just started a store myself. I just hired, you know, a manager or a VA or something. So yeah, it was, it was hard. Honestly, it was, I, I wish I had like an easy solution. Um, but the, the answer is if I didn't, if I didn't save all that money and invest all that money, I would have had to have, you know, started another business myself. And I know it sounds ridiculous because a lot of people listening to this who are just starting are like, you're just being lazy, Johnny. Like, why don't, you know, just put in the freaking work. You know, you, you know, you always talked about, you know, working hard, being focused, being productive. And now you know, self love. Yeah. And, you know, and it's like, dude, like you, like you guys don't understand, like, you know, entrepreneurs have a life cycle where, you know, like, it's like Muay Thai. Like, if you ask me, Johnny, like to start fighting professionally again, I'm like, no, I, I can't do it anymore. I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want, I'm glad I did it, but there is a zero chance you're going to put me in another ring now with some killer, like that's going to elbow me in the face. Like it just, I, there's no amount of money that you can pay me for me to do that again. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm like, uh, in the midst of that too, right? Cause right now we're dealing with a lot of partners and, um, a lot of moving parts and, you know, it's like, uh, whenever, you know, we spend high on advertising and, you know, say a sale doesn't come in, we're like, ah, and then I would have to go and fix the entire funnel myself. And then like, I'm just going back to journaling and meditating and like, uh, there's this uh, book. I don't know if you've ever read it. I would definitely recommend it. The Surrender Experiment by Michael Singer. Um, and it was just saying like, okay, all the things that are happening are just supposed to happen. And instead of using your ego to retract, maybe the lesson that you're about to learn in this will be very useful five or 10 years down the road. And you have no idea that these dots will actually connect. So I'm like in this weird feeling of wondering, should I continue scaling one of the projects that I'm working with one with one of the partners or, and I was, it was crazy because I was like journaling with this and, you know, I haven't done podcasting in a while now. So I'm kind of even seeing you reaching out to me as like a sign of, okay, what, what does this mean if I surrender into whatever life is showing up for me right now? And I'm realizing, I'm like, okay, maybe this is something that I could do on the side, right? Like uh, starting up the podcasting and seeing that maybe the big opportunity right now actually isn't in, you know, the immediate instant profits, but whenever a market crash happens or, you know, the world is in chaos, that's actually one of the best times to start going back and doing some networking, right? And even though there's not an instant, immediate financial gain, what you do have is now a fast, like a, a, a very um, growing, fruitful relationship that maybe a year or two or five when the markets catch up and, you know, the competition to get those people in your network is um, like increasing and now their DMs are flooded or their emails are flooded. So you can't even talk to them. You've kind of like solidified your spot because you've given them value in whatever way possible that now when the next business idea comes from, instead of, you know, me doing the operations, instead of them doing their operations, we're just letting the resources that we've collected on both sides to kind of play together and see what could happen and more on a higher strategic level to then move that business forward while still um, maintaining, you know, your current position of just enjoying life, you know? Yeah, I can see that. And I've definitely used this this time that everybody's stuck at home to not only reach out to people, you know, who, especially on like the Invest Like a Boss podcast, interview people who normally are too busy to, to do yeah. interviews. But also on a personal level, I've been reaching out to old friends, you know, people that I wanted to catch up with, like that just, you know, normally either I'm busy or I'm not thinking about it or they're busy. And yeah. just to kind of rekindle that friendship uh, or, you know, also like for you, for, you, for example, the, the, the reason why um, I reached out to you was or even I remembered, you know, like was this wired a uh, magazine article came out that fe- mentioned both of us and you were the cover of it, which is, you know, it was crazy. And, the, and like somebody had forwarded it to me. I think I saw it before you even saw it, <laughs> ironically, even though you're the face, but somebody, a, 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 I think it was a listener of the podcast or someone who, you know, messaged me saying, Hey, like um, you were mentioning this article and it was actually like a very short blurb. It was saying like, um, that the owner of Dojo like was like, yeah, it's because of this Johnny D F D guy that ah, it's all, all this Johnny F D's fault. Yeah, he's like, this is why Bali uh, and Changu got so popular with digital nomads and uh, and dropshippers. And I remember 
thinking like, man, I, I didn't even like Bali. I didn't even like Chengdu. I told people not to go, you know, but like, and here's what really like, and then here's what really pissed me off about that article was first off, I mean, the, the title was something like, um, you know, Bali dropshippers and the get, get rich quick overnight, you know, something. Yeah. And, but everybody they interviewed made money for dropshipping. They just all ended up doing something else because they realized that wasn't something that they, they wanted to do long term. And it was mainly because none of them were doing sustainable kind of like, like a real brand, you know, um, brand building. They were all selling, you know, cheap crap from AliExpress in China. And that's not even the method that I follow. Like when I push people towards Anton's course, Anton tells people not to sell from China or from AliExpress. He's like, no, like this is a, like, this is like a, a cash grab that's not going to last. You know, like you want to become an authorized dealer for a U.S. company or Australian company if you're from Australia, you know, like a domestic company. And you want like a real brand that you can build a business around. And I like it really annoyed me. And that's I, I made this, you know, video ranting about it. It's like a 25 minute video on my YouTube channel just ranting saying nobody even knows what dropshipping is. And that's when I reached out to you and I was like, man, like it sounds like Mike's like like that was a chapter in his life that he closed a long time ago. <laughs> and like they're still bringing him up now. Dude, that 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 piece when I when I looked at it, right? At first I was like a little bit angry cuz you know, the conversation that was like written wasn't actually like how our conversation went, right? It kind of like pulls the most sensationalized parts of you. Of course, yeah. Um and and that's why that's at first I was like what what the hell? Like we 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 had a great conversation and it just like really highlighted key things to let like the reader just make up their own mind and who like Johnny is or who Mike is, right? Um but then I kind of like took a step back and realized just how doing this on a bigger scale can be the easiest way to, for example, control an entire population, right? Mm -hmm. Just saying the truth, but not the entire truth, how media and writers and how news can start impacting and changing certain people's beliefs. And if they could do that by just, for example, like I had a lot of friends that read that and like, dude, I'm laughing because I could see how this could be you, but this isn't you, but this is the most sensationalized parts of you. Um, Like I could see how the narrative of me can change very easily. But if that's the case, then there's so much other things that could be very easily mistaken for what's the actual truth behind it. And and just seeing that, I was like, damn, man, it's like, I feel like the world craves more of these authentic conversations because in that short five minute article, you could get your, um, like, like anybody could just get their idea of who these people are. But if you're listening to a podcast like this, you could only like be like the mask version of you for like five, 10 minutes, but that's going to get tired. And then after an hour of getting coffee and like Wi-Fi switching and then Zoom's like changing, you're going to start realizing who the actual person behind the face is. And you'll realize, holy crap, like, you know, it, I'm actually learning more from this medium than a third party thing. Yeah, it's funny. Like every time I read, you know, a negative comment on a YouTube channel, like YouTube video or an article like that, I realize like, I mean, it used to really offend me and hurt me because I'm like, you know, these guys are like, you know, saying these bad things and they don't even know me, you know, or they think they know me, but they really don't. And I realize this is why I'm so happy that we, I have this podcast and that I do kind of longer form content now. Either my YouTube, even my uh, YouTube video is much longer now. Like, you know, we stopped, we, I think we both stopped doing those, all the jump cuts and like, you know, like the ADD yeah. attaching grab and stuff. And the thing is, what I really like about these long form conversations is people really get to know you and they're like, oh yeah, you know what? Maybe that was a sliver of, of who you were at some point, or maybe it's just like, not even a, not even really who you were, but just like a tiny sliver of your personality, you know? Like, yes, I happen to be in Chenggu eating a smoothie bowl while, uh, um, you know, while doing, you know, while working, you know, but it doesn't like that doesn't define who I was at the time. And doesn't doesn't de- definitely doesn't define who I am today. And I think it's the same with you where I really wanted to catch up with you again. because I was like, Oh, you know what, I haven't talked to Mike in a few years. I wonder what he's been up to. Because I can tell just by reading it. Like, I remember there was one line that had a lot of controversy when you know, they asked you how much money you made for dropshipping. And you said, Oh, like probably around 150 grand. And then you know, and then the next line, 
in the in the article was like, oh yeah, but like I don't have I don't keep records of it. I read that as yeah, you know what? If you ask me, I don't actually know exactly how much I made either. But if somebody really wanted to, like if you know you know if like Wired reached out to me, I'll be like, yeah, here's my my accountant's um, info. You can you can ask her for my W nine forms, or you can ask her for my my you know like tax return forms. You can you can get the exact amount if you want. But it was yeah like around two hundred fifty grand or whatever it was. And I think a lot of other people who read the article looking for something to hate on will be like, yeah, this guy didn't have the exact number. He didn't, you know, he didn't have proof on that moment. He didn't walk around with the, his, his um, yeah, tax like, return. Right. <laughs> I don't even wear like a shirt, dude. And, and I just wear Muay Thai shorts every day. Like I don't even have pockets. So I don't carry like my phone on me. Right. No, she was like, uh, she literally reached out. She's like, oh yeah. Uh, do you also have records? And I'm like, listen, I was doing my business and uh, you guys reached out and asked, like, can we do an interview? And normally I say no to a bunch of things, but she literally caught me in a, in a period of my life where I was like in a little experiment where I was like, okay, I'll just say, you know, yes, because this is the opportunity that's presenting itself. Right. And, you know, I, I literally pick her up because she didn't know like where to go. I gave her the exact place to stay at um, or recommendations here in Bali. Um, maybe even like showed around, invited her to um, some events because we had like some local digital nomad events. And I was like, yeah, just come on. Like you could go. She's like, oh, I don't know how to like get around. And I was like, okay, you could get on the back of my moped, right? So like I'm just driving her around like being Mr. Gojek or Mr. Grab uh, like bike for her and just like point her in different directions, like being very uh, civil um, and stuff like that. And, and it was just so weird how, you know, that entire conversation on my end was like very, okay, here, let me just give you as, as much value. Oh, you're trying to write for this magazine. Let me just give you my entire story and you can take whatever. And she just takes like the little bits of it and she's like, okay, this guy's a bad man. And uh, from there, like ask, like if you're going to meet somebody and you don't know someone and like, Hey, uh, give me some of your documents so I can see your net worth. And, and can you give me a screenshot of how much you have um, in stocks right now? Even though like it, it's all on your blog, right? If someone just came very aggressively forward at you and there's no like actually like relationship behind it or any context on why she actually needs that, you're, you're going to just brush it off because why would you like, like I'm not trying to prove myself to anybody. Right. So why the hell would I be walking around with, you know, my documents and, you know, my old Shopify accounts and stuff like that, just to prove this writer that I literally just invited into my home to then share with the story so that she could make money as a writer for this article. Yeah. And, and, and it's funny because when we read an article written by someone from, you know, Wired or these big magazines, we kind of assume they're like this super professional journalist that is, you know, like probably in their forties or fifties that like, you know, like is wearing, you know, it's like really professional about it. We don't realize a lot of times they're just like some random person that we just like, you know, you just we're like meet for a coffee, you know, you talk for a little bit and then they go home and they're like, okay, you know, I'm going to put on my, my, you know, my big boss pants now. I'm going to write this, you know, this, my, you know, this mm -hmm. article that's, that's going to be read by, you know, probably a million people. And how should I portray this? You know, what's the, what's the headline that I want to use to catch people? That will get the most so views. Share it. Yeah. And that, that's, you know, that's, I mean, but that's how media is. And I could be mad at that, or I can just say, you know what? The haters going to hate, right? They really are. They're going to find some excuse why something doesn't work. But yeah. then the other people that can read between the lines, I mean, because you can literally read that article 10 different ways. And I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes here. So if you guys really want to read it, but honestly, it's like reading a tabloid, right? Like, you know, it's like reading like, um, I don't know, like, like literally like, drama. yeah, like nobody, like who cares, you know? But he didn't give me a backlink, bro. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll yeah, do it yeah. so I can get a backlink for my blog and build domain authority. But there's no, <laughs> there's no link. Anything. Yeah, that was like but my the funny, strategy. yeah, yeah. I mean, a backlink but, on Wired didn't get. But at the same time, you know, I was gonna say like people who can read between the lines or want to, you know, say, okay, you know what? I read this point of view now. I now I, I know about this Mike Vaselli guy. I know about this Johnny FD guy. Let me do my own research and not like read, you know, anonymous. Um, comments on a YouTube video on a Reddit thread or something from people that don't even know you, but like, let me, like, let, let me, me listen know. to this. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, like, let me listen to this guy's, you know, podcast for, for an hour. And then let me, like, figure out, like, you know, and make my own decision on is this a business model that I want to, I want to uh, go towards or is this something I don't want to do? You know, is this someone who I want to follow and, you know, learn from or is this someone who I don't want to, 
follow him on from. And, and at the end of the day, I think even, you know, this somewhat, it wasn't even negative, but like this negative, you know, not positive publicity still ends yeah. up bringing more people to us anyway. So it really, it really doesn't hurt us. Dude, it sounds like the perfect uh, plot or pilot to a, like a reality TV show, you know, <laughs> like, uh, like Jersey Shore mixed with like, uh, you know, Tim Ferriss for our work week mixed with like all of that other stuff. I, I think yeah. the world would then need to see what's actually going on. Cause I don't think a lot of people know just what, what's happening on this side of the world, you know, mm. with like the possibilities that aren't just kind of like the traditional path. Yeah. I, you know, I've actually had uh, like journalists or like videographers want to just follow me around for a few days oh or a week. God. And I was like, you know, I, I like the idea of it, but honestly, like it's going to be really boring. It's like me sitting at a coffee shop for six hours and then going to the gym for an hour and then like meeting a friend for like dinner for an hour, like not that much goes on, you know? And I remember it was just for this like French TV channel. And I was like, you know what? The Nomad Summer is coming up in a few weeks. Come to that. Like you can, you know, you can really get like a, a highlighted experience of what life is like. You can follow me around there if you want, you know, and, but you can meet other nomads and talk to them, hear their stories. So I don't know if that ever got, if, if that, got, that aired yet, but like to me, like that is like like everything that we do, but like mega funneled into a three day event or five day event. Yeah, how is that doing now? Um, like you got you're doing that every year or so. Yeah, this is our like six year doing it, and uh, our biggest year was four hundred people, and I thought I wanted to grow it to five hundred, then six hundred, then a thousand. But what I realized is it's really hard to meet everybody in a, even in like a, a week, right? So we started, yeah. before it used to be like a two day event and then a three day event. And now we started doing like pre meetups, after meetups, you know, even things like going to this, you know, I, I would, I would rent a bunch of song towels and bring everyone to the sticky waterfalls after just net, network and hang out. So now mm-hmm. it's like a week long event, but even then it's really hard to meet everybody when the event is over. 300 people i would say that's the maximum where you can meet like most not not even everybody but like enough people where you're like okay i had a chance at least to meet everyone if i really wanted to and that's why i've now decided i'm gonna cap the events at 300 even though i could sell more tickets or i could have a bigger venue because i had asked myself like yeah. what what is the purpose of having more people and a part of it is like you know what yeah maybe we can you know make more money so i can hire more staff and take some responsibility off my plate or mm-hmm. maybe it's just the ego thing where I want to say I have a five per, 500 person event and, and I realize mm-hmm. it's more, more that than anything. Like if I, if my purpose is for people to meet each other and network, then having a 300 person event is actually better than having more people. And, you know, I think, you know, from now on, like we call it the 300 club or something like, you know, and, and really like, you know, so people that really are serious about going, you know, we probably have to raise the ticket prices a little bit, you know, per person, but even then it's so cheap. Like it's, it was underpriced before. So now like the, and that was another big fear was I used to try to keep as cheap as possible. So people who were ready in Chiang Mai and, and kind of like on a budget can go. But I also realized that like the people who are trying to save money and, and they don't see $200 as an investment of growing themselves and learning and meeting, you know, meeting like-minded people. Like I don't know. I don't honestly don't even want to attract them anymore. Like I want, mm. I want people who really take their lives seriously and say, you know what, if I'm going to go, I'm, you know, if I'm going to go to this, I'm going to really go to this. Have you ever uh, been to an A-Fest from my no, Valley? No, but I've heard of them. Yeah, yeah I, went sure. to, I, went to, I went to one of them uh, a year or two ago, and it was actually one of the most amazing experiences. It was like if TEDx had a baby with Burning Man, mm-hmm. had a baby with like Ubud, but had a baby with like high-level entrepreneurs, like there was like Olympic athletes and and like uh like like the, the owner of um the ninja warrior like american oh, yeah, cool. ninja warrior there's a bunch of like dope people there right and the way to get in there was they only capped it at like 250 cuz mm-hmm. they felt the same thing any more of it you can't get the meaningful relationships cuz now you're just at like a huge thing and there's so many faces but yeah their big objective yeah. is how can we get people to really create a strong tribe and anything more than 250 is much? And to make sure no one is like not supposed to be there, they have an interview process and then they charge, I think, four grand or five grand. So it's like, like it goes back to that thing uh, before. It's like you could have millions of views on YouTube or you could have 11 people that read your Medium article, but that 11 people have a bigger net worth. Um, the way they saw it, their business model was just so freaking dope because they just literally crowdfunded like with this event, like they get ticket sales. So each one's paying five grand. 
And then now they have all this money that they could just create fun experiences, like renting out an entire cliff house uh, bar to like getting all of the alcohol for uh, free. It's not free. They, they, they just use the money with the higher ticket mm-hmm. sales. But now what that's doing is instead of uh, competing in terms of price, they can now just give value and a, a crazier experience to the people that come in. So that was like one of the things that I saw. I was like, damn, if I was ever going to go in the event business, I would want to just make it super elite and then just make it a big excuse for all my friends to just meet up every single year, but also uh, bring in audiences, but also crowdfund it so it doesn't come out of pocket. And then to maybe get a business partner so I don't have to run it. <laughs> I think that would have been like my dream. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a lot of work, man. Like conferences are a lot of work. And I feel bad for the, all the ones that had to get canceled right now because a lot of those deposits are non-refundable. And all the you know, marketing and advertising spend you, you put out there, that's all non-refundable. That's all spent money. So I think a lot of events are going to go bankrupt during this time. And, and I'm really lucky that it, the only event that for us that got pushed back was the Tbilisi, Georgia event. And that was kind of a test anyway. So that was pretty small. And we had like just started selling tickets. But even then it was, you know, like it was still a financial actual hit you know like for the the last experiment event you know because i was you know i know if i just have it in chiang mai it'll always sell out because just because it's so established there but we did cancun mexico last year and that was hard to put on it was a lot of work and then we ended up losing i think it was like eight or nine thousand dollars like you know after everything and i was like i was like man we just did four months of work to lose nine mm. grand like it's it's you know a lot of people just wouldn't be able to do that you know and then what, what was the thing with uh, georgia because that's actually like, i think my ideal life uh, kind of like to just summarize everything that we talk about is mm-hmm. um, to have roots, but to bounce back between certain home bases. So I was thinking um, part of my time in Bali, part of my time in Thailand, and then part of my time in Georgia. And then if I stay there for like three to six months, those are perfect hubs for me to then either jump to Europe or to Russia because my girlfriend's Russian. Um, or if I'm in Thailand, I could go hit all the islands, but Bali, you know, it was just home, right? So, and I have a dog. So w- w- what's like this cool thing about Georgia that, you know, is getting you there all the time? Is it just the Georgian women? Is it like the Georgian cuisine? Is it the Wi-Fi is better than freaking Sri Lankan Bali? Yeah, it's, uh, so I've been, for the last, you know, five years, I've been looking for the next Chiang Mai, right? I love Chiang Mai, but I always so feel, you know what, it's only during like it's really only during um, the burning season it's like and unfortunately it used to be just march and then it was like end of february to april and then last year was like the worst year we started kind of end of january and i was like man it's just like you know it's just getting like not even like even if it gets better people are still afraid of being there during burning season or they start hearing about it so they started leaving like mid january or early january when the, even the air was still great like you know maybe you had like two bad days in the month but like the rest of it was really good and the weather is perfect during that time it doesn't rain it's you know sunny during the day but it's you know chilly at night so you can sleep well it's without even AC. bad during the lantern festival like i was there in the lantern festival and it was just so bad i was like what is going on my eyes Eyes were hurting my sinuses wow. were hurting yeah like they're messing it up man because like they so thailand try, is trying to level up you know um and become more westernized basically so they don't want as many scooters around anymore they want to encourage everyone to have like cars and trucks and like there's getting there's just getting more pollution you know and it's not a huge city and it's like it's surrounded by mountains which is normally beautiful but also traps in all the, the smoke and the pollution so it's like it's that I would say that's one big reason, and the second big reason is the visas are getting harder and harder to stay long term, yeah. and it's just making me think. You know what? I love Chiang Mai. I still want to go back every year, November, December, maybe part of January. But then I, I want to spend the rest of the year somewhere else. You know, I love Thai food. I love I love the community in Chiang Mai. It's like it really is the easiest place in the world to live. But it's not somewhere I want to be year round anymore, and. I want, I, you know, I want to find another option. Um, but but you, know, you created that, right? That, that was just like a five to seven year thing. So if you could create a, another Chiang Mai anywhere, because you also got to think a lot of that influence came from like you talking about it, then people telling their friends and people that are telling their friends. So that's why you're kind of like a Chiang Mai celebrity, right? But like you could create the next Chiang Mai anywhere. So what I'm curious is, is Georgia, 
with your uh, Chiang Mai influential powers, do you think like that would be the next bet for finding the next Chiang Mai? Because right now I'm kind of getting sick of Bali right now and I'm still just trying to find, okay, I want to move somewhere um, like a little bit midterm, right? But I also want to just bounce back to Bali for like a month or two, but then get the fuck out of here. Uh, what would that be? And, and uh, like, I, I, I for, for some reason I'm getting pulled to Georgia. Um, so that's why I was like really curious and you're like, let's just talk on the podcast, man. Cause it's going to be yeah, good yeah. So Tbilisi is prime. It's ready. Like I've, I've been to so many uh-huh. countries now, right? I've been to like 50 plus countries and all the nomad hotspots from, you know, Bali to Lisbon to Berlin to like, you know, Grand Canary, Canary Islands, like everywhere that someone says like, this is it. Like, this is it. I go there and I'm like, yeah, that's not it. Tbilisi, uh-huh. the, Tbilisi was the first place I went where I was like, yep. Like literally the only thing, the only two downsides of it. One is winter is a cold, but just, you know, I'll just spend the, the other seven months or eight months of the year there and just go somewhere else, go back to Thailand for winter. Really? And second, the what it's just getting started. And that thing, it reminds me of Chiang Mai 10 years ago when I first went, but it's prime. Like when I, I remember even like 10 years ago, Chiang Mai was just ready for tourists. They had the coffee shops, you know, or, or the coffee shops are just being built, right? But they had a few that you could tell like, okay, they, they like the few they have are really good. Uh, they had a ton of combination of super easy to find. It was just like cost of living were low. Food was amazing. So Tbilisi is basic Chiang Mai 2012, right? No. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Dude, wait, what about like South compared to South America? Because I was like curious about, you know, Colombia or Brazil. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't stay there long term? No, no way. And also just even like setup factor, right? Like, you, you know, you, you show up in Medellin. Are you going to like, how easy does it find an affordable one bedroom uh, apartment for a month that's furnished? Like, you know, you go to Airbnb, pr- then it's getting more and more expensive, you know? I say we and, create uh, Georgia to be the next Tbilisi then. We should just like shill it really hard. Be like, we're all, I'll be like your sidekick. You know, you'll be yeah. Batman and I'll be Robin. And I'll just be like, Tbilisi, let's go. And we can just kind of like jumpstart the culture there. Yeah, let's do it, man. I, like it's it's literally prime for it. And I I got there last summer. I showed up one month after the Tbilisi Digital Nomad Group was even made. Like like a month prior, oh, wow. there wasn't even a group. And so I was kind of like that first batch, almost like I was in Chiang Mai, where it was like you know ten of us were the first kind of nomads to you know be there, find it, and start talking about it. And what what I really like about it, the reason why I know it's a long term place is pretty much every single person I had met during that trip is either had decided to move there permanently or, you know, they're still there or they're, they're coming back. Like, that's how I know, mm. like, this is a sticky spot. And then um, wh- when do you think you're going to move there? Because for me, we were planning, uh, my villa at least ends in February, right? But also it's like, we can't really go anywhere. So I'm thinking, okay, I could just work and just build everything and just sustain it. And then that way, you know, when I leave to a new place, because I know my mind will start shifting and scrambling every single time you move to a new place, that would just be, you know, the next version of Mike Bastille, which would be even more on a higher level strategic business mm-hmm. partnerships instead of just like the operational Mike Vasile that's just making these YouTube videos just to make YouTube videos and not having systems in place to really just make money on autopilot without depending on, you know, making videos or running ads or anything. Um, So I literally see that if we're going to talk about like the Parkinson's law as just kind of like my death line on when I need to really get things done. Um, But after February, I'm looking to just get out of Bali for a bit and maybe, but it might be cold, right? Like February in Georgia. Yeah. You don't want to go until like May, you know, but honestly, I kind of, I I miss having like a month of cold. So my original plan was to go in April to Ukraine or to Georgia and just like have a little tiny bit of winter just so I can like, you know, have that, that experience, but then have summer come right after. Like a Wim Hof, like a Wim Hof month. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Cause I mean, I've been spoiled, man. I haven't seen winter in like 10 years and Mm. you know, I don't want to be forced to be in winter, especially for like five, six months of darkness and you know, no sun. But I feel like I've been living summer for like 10 years now. And it's like, I need need to change it up. You're like, I haven't seen snow. Uh, What's, what's Sri Lanka like? Is it, would you stay there more? The Wi-Fi is kind of like, should people say it's like Bali, but like a year ago no 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 it's probably like 20 years ago 20 years ago yeah like not like that many tour I, I really like it i like it way more than so all, everything that you like about bali sri lanka has but just like starting out 
right? So if you, you know, you like, you know, beaches, you like surfing, imagine what the, the beaches were like in Bali 20 years ago before it became over touristed. You know, there, there, there's a beach right across from me, like literally across the street called Kabbalana. I go there, there's like nobody there. Like I'm like there are many days, I'm the only one on this beach and it's beautiful. Not a piece of garbage, no vendors trying to sell you crap. It's just beautiful beach, mm. but good surfing you know, on the island. And the, you know, there's not that many restaurants or cafes yet, but the ones that are here, you know, are like really like cozy. Cause like everyone, like, you know, they, there are other people who, I mean, the tourists in general, but especially people that move here, they're the ones that like kind of are a little bit more open-minded and saying, you know what, I don't need to go to the place that has like that, you know, 10 plus wow factor. And everyone's gonna be like, Oh, yeah. you're in Bali. Oh, you're, you know, you must be cool. You know, people are like Sri Lanka, where is that? But the people that, that come here, they're like, they know what's up. They're like, okay, you know what? This in 10 years is going to be overcrowded, overpriced, over touristed. But right now it's perfect. But it's, it's well, not perfect the- yet. That's the downside is it's like uh, just starting. Absolutely. It's like a little bit what early. Would be, what would be like your perfect bounce back? So Georgia, then Chiang Mai, then like, how would you like divide it up? Like if we were going to look at your life on a yearly basis? Yeah. So ideally I would spend November, December, maybe January in Chiang Mai. And if the visas were easy, I would probably spend two or three months, maybe two months on one of the islands, maybe like Koh or something. Because I, I think Koh Phangan right now, they, they just opened up a few really nice co-working spaces. And, you know, I hate to call it Bali style, but like the yeah. Chiang Mai, I would say that the one big draw to Bali was just everything is so Instagrammable and so beautiful. And as much as we hate that being a reason why people go places, it, it kind of is, you know, you know, and it attracts the artistic, creative people, you know, attracts, you know, like that crowd that it's kind of nice to be around right like to balance the entrepreneur crowd that just doesn't care <laughs> at all about aesthetics yeah. but just like is hustle working I, I i think with bali like you know there's so many reasons why i don't like it, but a lot of it is you know it, it's like infrastructure kind of sucks it's kind of it's, you know a lot of things are kind of just like not as convenient as, as chiang mai you know like there's workarounds to everything but like it's not it's just not like easy and straightforward chiang mai is like the easiest place to live in the world you know like and a but now, but it was never like so super Instagrammable. But now there's like, you know, these really beautiful Bali style court spaces opening in Chiang Mai. There's one called Kala that just opened in Koh Phangan. There's Co Space that just opened. And I think, I think people are going to start going back again. I, I really do. Um, but yeah, so anyways, I'll spend those couple months in Thailand. And then for summer, Europe is amazing. Like it's, there's no better place in the world than Europe in the summer. And whether it's going to be so Europe and Georgia. So Georgia is technically Europe. It's, it's, it's like right on the cusp of, it's like as east as you could possibly get and still have it considered on the European continent. But it's not, it's not Europe, European, like, but there are European um, elements to it. And even the food. All right, like it's that's why I like Georgian food so much. Not only are the restaurants super good and super cheap, but in even in just Georgian cuisine, not even talking about the expat restaurants, but just Georgian cuisine, you have like European style food, like steak and potato kind of things. You have Russian food because it's, it's bordering Russia. Oh, yeah. You have you know all that like delicious like soups and salads and like the um, like the dumplings and all that, the bread kind of stuff. Then you have Asian influence because it's right on the border of Asia where you have their national dish is called Kinkali, which is basically like a big uh, Chinese soup dumpling that is their version of it. Oh, yeah. And then in the South, you have the Middle East, like Azerbaijan and Armenia and all those places. So in their food, you also have all that influence where you have like just in their cuisine, like a one Georgian menu would ha- be like eight pages long and you'd be like, man, what? like this has everything and it's delicious. It's so, it's, it's, it's so good. Sounds like the European Malaysia. Yeah, a little bit, but it's way better than Malaysia. Damn. Dude, you make me want to move, dude. Yeah, but like, I mean, I don't want to see the thing is, I don't want to overhype it because if you just show up, you'd be like, yeah, technically, like, this has everything that Johnny says, but it's missing something. I mean, you could, and the first, you can't really tell what it is, but it really is just community there's not enough yeah. people like right now there's probably you know 30 no bads there like that's it you know and there's one event you know per week because there's only 30 nomads so like this doesn't make sense to have more but that's why i want to get a big bunch of people you know bunch of people there to kind of kickstart it you know like it really 100 uh, percent reminds me of chiang mai 2013 when there was 13 digital nomads <laughs> like you know and, and before it all started and then everything's good right like uh are you walking everywhere there's not like cars like going in and out it's super walkable 
Bowl. Medical. Yeah, like uh, I think medical is okay. I, I I never had to go to a hospital, but I've heard it's okay. Um, and it's very walkable, except for some reason crossing crossing like big roads. But there's always a kind of like the underground you can you can walk through it. But it's walkable. But the Ubers there are so cheap. And they're so and they're good. You know, and it's so and it's, it's very to, easy to get around. Like some, no, no, zero. Like, you, like nobody's gonna scam you in Georgia. It's weird. It's like you know, like okay, so here's what I don't like about Bali, right? You show up and if you don't know uh if you don't know that like how to do it you're gonna get scammed at the airport 100 yeah. percent. right you know uh you're gonna end up you know you, you like it's hard to tell the difference between ten thousand a hundred thousand you know like how much do i pay for for a taxi i don't know you know <laughs> georgia is like the opposite like you show up and it's like everything's me you know basically everything's metered or you just call an uber and it's like eight bucks to get from the airport right and then or you can take a, a local bus for like 50 cents you know and they both get you to the city center you know the the accommodations are so cheap and they're furnished and they're nice and you know you can join a nice co-working space that's not you know 200 bucks a month you can join a nice gym that's not too you know 175 or 200 bucks a month like you know everything is like cheap and good like good quality and cheap Dude, i'm so excited man it's like now it's just literally i want to just buckle down um systematize everything for the next like eight months or so and then just uh go back to that thing that after like for example reading your book i was just like i'm just gonna own less than 100 things and just like find a home i don't know where it is but you know i'm just gonna find it right and like i, I i've lived in bali now for i think two ish years and even that just blows my mind and i'm realizing like i think for me to grow i need to kind of change the environment because now it's like you know it's bad when you blink yep. and then you're waking up and then you blink and then it's nighttime yep. and then days are starting to like blend in together um and whenever that happens that just freaks me out because that just makes you realize just how short life is and it's only a matter of a couple of these blinks before you look in the mirror and you're like 80 years old and you're like shit right yeah yeah i think that's but i think that's the danger of like wanting to settle down somewhere is you might just like get too comfortable <laughs> Right. Like back in the US, I remember, you know, six months would pass. And I'm like, what did I do? Like, and am I, am I in a better place? Like, I think it's okay if you're blinking and every time, you know, a day passes, but you had, you know, gotten in better shape, you had made more money, you had saved, invested more money, you had improved your relationships, you had improved your health, then it's good, right? It's a good to kind of fall into that flow routine where you wake up a year later and you're like, oh, wow, I kept it last a year, but, you know, now I can handstand. Now I'm, I can, you know, I can surf. <laughs> I have more money in my bank account now. I'm in better shape. I have a better relationship. That's good. It's bad when you wake up and you blink and you wake up in a year and you're like, man, I gained 10 pounds. My bank, my bank balance is exactly the same as it was last year or maybe even less. I have more debt now. Uh, you know, I'm not in a better place. I'm not happier. I didn't mm. learn any new skills. I didn't learn a new language. That's, that's the danger. Mm. What would you say, um, like, cause, cause I have to head out in a bit, uh, but, but I also want to like see any ways to like serve you. What would you say like in your entire life right now, what would, what, what are like your biggest challenges and pain points that are preventing you from then leveling up to the next Johnny FD? It's hard because I used to think if I can, if I can get to a million in net worth, I'll be happy. It was just a goal, right? Like, you know, I never thought, you know, growing up, my parents are always you know, just like yours, like immigrant parents never made that much money. So the idea of being a millionaire, like actual net worth millionaire just seemed so ridiculous. And as I started seeing that path to it, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to write my third book until, until I get to, to a million. So the first was 12 weeks of Thailand, a good life on the cheap, literally living, you know, 600 bucks a month and, mm. you know, travel, Muay Thai, scuba diving, full moon party. Second book is called Life Changes Quick. That was when I first started making a lot of money and eating paleo and just going super, you know, extreme, bad direction, entrepreneur, CrossFit, paleo and falling in love. And the third book, I haven't started writing it yet, but I was like, you know, I got to get to a million so I can write this book because that, that was my goal. The problem is I know that my life would not change at all once I get to a million. I know I'm not going to be any happier. I know I'm not even really going to buy much more because the difference between having 700,000 and having a million means I can buy one house in LA and I can be broke. <laughs> you know, or I can have I can you know have, you know, 2500 a month in in uh, investment income and li continue living cheaply like I am now. Like it's not going to change my life at all. And the best and worst thing that's ever happened to me was through the through meeting Sam Marks, my my co-host from Invest Like a Boss. I've now met and hung out with so many multimillionaires. You know, party with them, travel with them, and I realize none of them are really that happy. Or you know, it's not the money that makes them happy. 
you know, by having a bigger business and having more money, usually they're more stressed, they're more busy. And I'm like, you know what, maybe, maybe I've already kind of made it. Like I think, you know, being broke and <laughs> stressed about money is not good, but having more isn't necessarily going to make me happier. And, and, you know, I know like the, both of us are friends with Mike Chang and I just had him on the podcast two episodes ago, actually. And he really? talked about his, his journey too. And I'm like, you know, he's much happier now than he was when he was, you know, had a $13 million a year business. He's much happier now. He's my roommate. Oh yeah. That's crazy. Right? Yeah. 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 Uh, but he's stuck in Texas right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, coming back. But yeah, dude, it's like, like hanging out with him has been freaking like life changing. Right. Because it's like, you have this Mr. Miyagi like, character um that left his business and here am i you know um an angsty uh 20 ish year old entrepreneur that just wants to like make it to prove to like i guess um my childhood self that i was worthy i am enough and then i have you know these people that are like 10 20 years older than me just saying that that wasn't what made me happy. Like it was actually really interesting, right? Because when I wanted to, right before I lost a bunch of money at like a business that I went really aggressive in, I asked two people advice and it was uh, Mike Chang from Six Pack Shortcuts and uh, Papa from The Game. So okay. I messaged them both and I'm like, hey man, like I- I'm-, I'm looking to start this thing. I just need your advice. And then they gave me advice back when they were still kind of like more on the business side of things. And then even just recently, right, I uh, reconnected with um, what's called Papa and I reconnected. Well, well, Mike now, you know, we live in the same villa together um, until he got left, when, until he had to go back to Texas because he just couldn't come back to Bali because the borders kind of shut down. Is both of them, and this also blew my mind because Papa from the game was experiencing the exact same thing. And I was like, this is crazy because they both came through the exact same thing, you know, starting off, you know, as a victim, then building a huge company, uh, either six pack shortcuts or real social dynamics to them completely leaving it or putting it on autopilot so that they could then pursue, you know, uh, more spiritual things, right? Like, uh, like I was talking to Papa and he was like, yeah, you know, I systematize, you know, real social dynamics. So I've just been, you know, meditating more and like going to events and uh, k pasanas, which is like, like the pasanas, but like more California. What, what like ketamine or like what, what does the K sound for? K- Koreatown know. pasana? Like, I don't know. He's, I think because the person that made it was like Mexican. <laughs> like, que pasa? You know? Oh my God. Okay. Uh, but I don't know. I, I'm talking to Papa and then I'm like, dude, he's so happy, man. And it's like, I, I remember I met him three years before or two years before um, in San Francisco. And he was just like, business, 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 business. But then I'm talking to him now and he's like, we are all one. And I'm like, wow, this is so crazy. So I'm, I'm like, me in my 20s, I'm seeing all of these people that are going down the path that I'm going in that actually left the path. And I'm wondering if I'm going to actually like make the most of my life in my 20s and 30s because I know I'm going to make a lot of mistakes could I just circumnavigate that and just start pursuing what it is they're pursuing? Because if they built, you know, $10 million plus year businesses and they'd either want to automate it and leave or just like Mike Chang's case, just leave, even though he was a face of it, then there has to be like something along the lines of doing that while also creating a bunch of profit on your end without actually having much responsibility. So I think the past couple of weeks, it's literally been a search for how can I combine both of those worlds? Yeah, I, I, I wish I can give you better advice than this, but sometimes people need to touch, touch the pot to know, you know, that it's hot, right? You can't yeah. just, you can't, you can't just have someone tell you like, Hey, don't touch that. <laughs> it's hot. You got, you got to sometimes experience it yourself. But I would say the, at the same vein, you know, don't burn yourself with like air, you know, with not what was it, whatever that word is, like the damage that you can't get back. Right. Like don't burn down the yeah. house or, you know, or, you know, or have any permanent injuries while you're doing it. I would say the number one piece of advice I would give you, but anyone else in this position is if you want to go that path, do it, but make sure that you save 80% of that money. Because imagine if you do this path the next 10 years and you realize it's not for you, but then you'll spend all the money. Not only are you 10 years, uh, like um, t- 10 years older, you just wasted 10 years of your life, nothing. But as, if, as long as you had saved most of that money and invested it, you know, and, and not invested it in like super risky stuff like crypto or another, you know, super risky business, like actually invested in something that, you know, is relatively stable, whether it's real estate or stocks or something, you know, index funds or something, as long as you still have that, then it was, it was a worthy journey. But if you come out of this without anything, then you wasted your time. Mm, but you'll have an epic story for a podcast. <laughs> 
Yeah, but you know what? I'd, I'd rather, I mean, there's enough of those stores, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> and then make money from the sponsors or something. And then, and then now your life is just going from one crazy event to one crazy event and then charging yeah, no. 50 grand per sponsor like Tim Ferriss. Yeah, or more like Wolf of Wall Street, like Jason Belford, right? Like, I, honestly, I don't really want to be that guy. Like, I don't want to be the guy who had a lot and then lost it all because either he did it illegally or uh, yeah. didn't save the money or, you know, or maybe both, right? Like, I'd rather... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it's it's the same thing with like just you know starting out, right? Like the the smart way to do it is to build a business, have income, have savings, have the skills, then sell your stuff and move to Thailand. But mm. I know most people aren't going to do that, and that's not what I did. You know, I just showed up, and then I said, uh, "Let me figure it." Like I'm broke, I have no skills. Let me figure it out from there. Sometimes people just got to do that. You got you got to learn. You know, you got to learn from your own mistakes. Mm. And then uh, just to like sign off because uh, like I have to head out soon. But like in terms of your challenges, then um, is there any way that I could like add value to you or any parts that you're struggling with that would help out in any way. Mike, I appreciate you, buddy. You, you, you've helped out enough, man. Like, no, seriously, just live your life, man. Enjoy your life. And it's funny because this is supposed to be an interview <laughs> on my podcast for you, but it almost sounds like you've, you've been interviewing me this entire time. So maybe we can just post some both channels or something because it's, it's, it's been a good experience, man. Like, and, and it's, it's, it's nice, like seeing, you know, someone who was kind of in my shoes years ago because it reminds me of what that hustle meant drive was but also remind you know it clarifies yeah. for me now what i want to do next so actually just talking to you about this that has helped me really? a lot. i appreciate it yeah yeah well, so well, yeah georgia. yeah but seriously I, like i look forward to seeing you in georgia you know we can definitely team up to do something you know if if nothing else you can you, you know you can be a speaker a keynote speaker at the the event um but yeah let me know if there's anything i can do for you as well perfect man well i have to head out but dude like i said thank you for um like reaching out that meant a lot and I mean, we got each other on WhatsApp, so we just talk there. Yeah, we'll hang out. Guys, thanks so much for, for listening. Hope you enjoyed this episode. It literally was just like you, Hank, sitting next to us while me and Mike talked. I think both of us kind of forgot we were recording for a while. We're just catching up and talking. So uh, hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe, share this with a friend, and see you guys uh, in, the, yeah, in, in the next podcast. Leave a review on iTunes if you can as well. See you, Mike, and see all of you guys. Yeah. See, that was dope. Yeah. That was dope. Pod. Loved it. Thank you for listening to the Travel Like a Boss podcast. If you want to hear more, including the bonus, how to choose the perfect niche episode, join our mailing list at travellikeabosspodcast.com. See you next week. And remember, if you want to travel like a boss, you need to be your own boss. So start your online business today and start living the lifestyle you've always dreamed of.